Section 11 of Roman History, the Early Empire by William Wolfe Capes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 5. Nero, A.D. 54 to 68, Part 1. We read that when Domitius was told he had a son, he said that any child of his by Agrippina must prove an odious and baneful creature. The mother asked her brother Gaius the emperor to give the child a name, but he pointed to Claudius, his laughing stock, and said that the little one should bear his name, though the mother angrily protested at the omen. Soon afterwards he lost his parents' care by death and banishment, and was brought up at the house of his aunt Lepida, entrusted to the charge of a dancing master and a barber, till brighter times came back, with the return of his mother from her place of exile. He rose with Agrippina's rise to power and became the central object of her ambitious hopes, for the sister of one emperor and wife of another, she was determined to be the mother of a third. At the age of ten she had him made the adopted son of Claudius when he took the name of Nero. The choice of Seneca to be his tutor met with the approval of men of worth and culture, the appointment of Burrus to be the sole prefect of the Praetorian Guard secured the support of the armed force of Rome. His betrothal to Octavia strengthened his claims still further and stirred the jealousy of the young Britannicus and the grave fears of the old servants like Narcissus. The issue showed how well-founded were those fears. As soon as the death of Claudius was made known, Nero, hurrying to the camp of his advisers, spoke the soldiers fairly, and making ample promises of largesse, was saluted emperor by acclamation. The claims of Britannicus were set aside, and no voice was raised even in the Senate in his favor. At first the strong will of Agrippina seemed to give the tone to the new government. Votes were passed in her honor by the Senate. The watchword given to the soldiers was, the best of mothers. To satisfy her resentment or to calm her fears, Narcissus had to die. That she might take her part in all concerns of the state, the Senate was called to the palace to debate, where behind a curtain she could hear and not be seen. But the two chief advisers of the prince, though they owed their places to her favor, had no mind to be the tools of a bold bad woman, behind whom they could still see the form of the haughty minion palace. The prefect of the Praetorians, Afranius Burrus, who wielded the armed force of the new government, was a man of grave and almost austere character, whose name had long stood high at Rome for soldierly discipline and honor. His merits had given him a claim to his high rank, and he would not stoop to courtier-like compliance. He used his weighty influence for good, though he had at times to stand by and witness evil which he was powerless to check. Lucius Annius Seneca represented the moral force of the Privy Council, though he had the more yielding and compliant temper of the two. Sprung from a rich family of Cordoba in Spain, his wealth and good connections and brilliant powers of rhetoric had made him popular in early life with the highest circles of the capital, till he gained to his cost the favor of the emperor's sister. Banished by the influence of Messalina, he had turned to philosophy for comfort, and won high repute among the serious world of Rome by the earnestness and fervor of his letters. Few stood higher among the moral writers of the day, no one seemed fitter by experience and natural tastes to be the director of the conscience of the young nobility. With rare harmony, though different methods, the two advisers used their influence to sway the young emperor's mind and to check the overweening pride of Agrippina. They took the reins of power from her hand and reassured the public mind which had been unnerved by the despotic venal government of late years with its tyrant menials and closet trials. They restored to the Senate some portion of its old authority and chose the public servants wisely. For five years the world was ruled with dignity and order, for the young emperor reigned in name but did not govern, and the acts that passed for his were grave and prudent, while the very words even were put into his mouth for state occasions. When the Senate sent a vote of thanks, he bade them keep their gratitude till he deserved it, 
and when he had to sign a death warrant he said that he wished he was not scholar enough to write his name the pretty phrases were repeated men did not stay to ask if they were senecas or neros but hoped that they might prove the keynote of the new reign but the two ministers meantime had cause for grave misgivings for they had long studied their young charge with watchful eyes and had seen with regret how little they could do to mould his character as they could wish burris had failed to teach him in the camp any of the virtues of a soldier all the lessons of temperance hardihood and patience left no traces in his mind seneca had been warned we read by agrippina that the quibbles of philosophy would be too mean for his young pupil he had little taste himself for the orators of the republic and did not care to point to them for lessons of manly dignity and freedom but he did his best to teach him wisdom spoke to him earnestly of duty wrote for him moral treatises full of thought and epigram on themes like clemency and anger but could not drop the language of the court and hinted in his very warnings that the prince was raised above the law was almost a god to make and to destroy nero even from his youth had turned of choice to other teachers he had little taste for the old roman drill in arms and law and oratory and was it was noted the first of the emperors who had his speeches written for him from lack of readiness in public business but he had a real passion for the arts of greece for music poetry and acting had the first masters of the age to train him studied with them far into the night and soon began to pride himself upon the inspiration of the muses to gain time for such pursuits he was well content to leave the business of the state to graver heads and to take his part only in the pageant he had other pleasures of a meaner stamp soon it was the talk of rome that the young emperor stole out in disguise at night went to low haunts or roved about the streets with noisy roisterers like himself broke into taverns and assaulted quiet citizens and showed even in his mirth the signs of latent wantonness and cruelty his boon companions were not slow to foster the pride and insolence of rank to bid him use the power he had and free himself without delay from petticoat rule and the leading strings of greybeards their counsels fell on willing ears he had long been weary of his mother she had ruled him as a boy by fear rather than by love and now she could not stoop willingly to a lower place she wanted to be regent still and hoped perhaps to see her son content to sing and act and court the muses while she governed in his name but he had listened gladly to ministers who schooled him to curb her ambition and assert himself he looked on calmly while they checked her control over the senate put aside her chief adviser pallas annulled the despotic acts of the last reign and took the affairs of state out of her hands she was not the woman to submit without a struggle there were stormy scenes sometimes between them and then again she tried with woman's blandishments to recover the ground that she had lost she talked of the wrongs of the young britannicus and spoke of stirring the legions in his favour as nero's love for octavia cooled she took to her home the injured wife and made public parade of sympathy and pity when it was too late she changed her course of action condoned and offered even to disguise the amorous license on which she had frowned before so sternly and tried in vain to win his love with a studied tenderness that would refuse him nothing nero's chief ministers had put him on his guard against her and roused his jealousy and fear they had now to stand by and see the struggle take its course and watch the outcome with a growing horror britannicus of whose name such imprudent use was made was stricken at dinner with a sudden fit and taken out to die as all men thought by poison his poor sister hid her grief in silence but she was soon to be divorced agrippina was first stripped of all her guard of honour and forced to leave her house upon the palatine false informers were let loose upon her and wanton insolence encouraged it was murmured that the dread locusta was at work brewing her poisonous drugs and that three times they tried in vain to poison her one day it was found that the canopy above her bed was so arranged that the ropes must soon give way and the whole crush her as she lay in sleep at length 
Nero could wait no longer, and he found a willing tool in Anicetus, the admiral of his fleet, and between them a dark plot was hatched. It was holiday time, and Nero was taking the baths at Baiae. Suddenly he wrote a letter to his mother full of sorrow at the past estrangement, and of hopes that they might live on better terms if she would only come and see him as of old. She came at once, and found a hearty welcome was pressed to stay on one plea or another till at last night was come nero conducted her to a barge of state and left her with tender words and fond embraces she was not far upon her homeward way across the bay when at a signal given the deck fell crashing in and the barge rolled over on its side and the crew far from coming to the rescue struck with their oars at agrippina and her women as they struggled in the water but she was quiet and kept afloat a while till a boat picked her up and carried her to her home to brood over the infamous design at last she sent a messenger to tell her son that she was safe though wounded nero baffled in his murderous hopes and haunted by fears of vengeance was for a while irresolute he even called into counsel seneca and burrus and told them of his plot and of its failure they would have no hand in her death though they had no hope perhaps no wish to save her while they talk, Anicetus acts. He hastens with an officer or two to Agrippina's house, makes his way through the startled crowd about the shore, and finds her in her bedroom all alone. There, while she eyes them fiercely and bids them strike the womb that bore the monster, they shower their blows upon her and leave her lifeless body gashed with wounds. End of section 11. Section 12 of Roman History, the Early Empire by William Wolfe Capes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 5. Nero, A.D. 54 to 68, Part 2. The ministers of Nero, Burrus and Seneca, must share the infamy of this unnatural deed. They had already tarnished their good name by mean compliance. To save the power that was slipping from their grasp, they had closed their eyes to Nero's vices. They had tried even to cloak his youthful passion for a freedwoman by a paltry subterfuge. They had held their peace when Britannicus was poisoned, and stooped even to share the bounties that were showered at the time upon the courtiers. And now they sunk so low in good men's eyes as to defend the deed from the thought of which even Nero at first shrunk aghast. Burrus, we read, sent officers of the Praetorian Guard to announce the soldiers' joy that their sovereign was safe forever from his mother's plots. Seneca's hand drew up the dispatches to the Senate, in which the murdered woman was charged with treasonable designs against the emperor's life, and all the worst horrors of the days of Claudius were raked up to cover her memory with shame. The Senate, too, was worthy of its prince, and voted solemn thanksgivings for his safety, while Thrasia alone protested by his silence, and walked out of the house at last, when he could brook their flattery no longer. Even distant cities found an excuse for mean servility. One deputation came to beg Nero in the name of the provincials, to bear his heavy grief with patience the emperor came back to rome to find the city decked out in festive guise to greet him like a conquering hero so rid at length of all fear of rivalry or moral restraints from his advisers he gave free vent to his desires music and song the circus and the theatre had been the passion of his childhood and they were now to be the chief object of his life he shared the tastes of the populace of Rome, and catered for them with imperial grandeur. No cost or care was spared to make the spectacles imposing and worthy of the master of the world. The old national prejudice had looked on the actor's trade as almost infamous for free-born Romans, but Nero drove upon the stage citizens of rank, knights, and senators of ancient lineage, and made them play and act and dance before the people. The historian Dion Cassius rises from his sober prose almost to eloquence when he describes the descendants of the conquered races 
pointing the finger at the sons of the great families from which their victors sprung the greeks asking with surprise and scorn if that was indeed mummius the spaniards marvelling to see a scipio the macedonians and aemilius before them at last as if it were to cover their disgrace or as many thought to share it nero appeared himself in public and sang and played and acted for the prize and sought the plaudits of the crowd he did not take it up as the mere pastime of an idle day but practised and studied in real earnest showed feverish jealousy of rival actors and humbly bowed before the judges as if the contest were a real one no one might leave the theatre while he played vespasian was seen to nod and sunk at once in his good graces five thousand sturdy youths were trained to sit in companies among the audience and give the signal for applause not content with such display at rome he started even in the provinces the greeks were the great connoisseurs of all the fine arts in their towns were glorious prizes to be won and greece alone was worthy of his voice and talents greece was worthy also of her ruler nowhere was adulation more refined nowhere did men flatter with more subtle tact the pride and vanity of the artist prince we cannot doubt that nero had a genuine love of art it may seem as if he lived to justify the modern fancy that art has a sphere and canons of its own and may be quite divorced from moral laws but indeed the art of nero and his times was bad and that because it was not moral it set at naught the eternal laws of truth and simplicity of temperance and order in poetry and music it was full of conceits and affectations straining after the fantastic in plastic art size was thought of more than beauty of proportion and men aimed at the vast and grandiose in enormous theatres and colossal statues in place of the delicate refinement of greek tastes its drama sought for coarse material effects it did not try by flight of fancy to stir the nobler feelings of the heart but relied on the sensuous pageantry and carnal horrors to goad and sate the morbid taste for what was coarse ferocious and obscene nero's life as emperor was one long series of stage effects of which the leading feature was a feverish extravagance his return from the art tour in greece outdid all the triumphal processions of the past thousands of carriages were needed for his baggage his sumpter mules were shod with silver and all the towns he passed upon his way received him through a breach made in their walls for such he heard was the sign of honour with which their citizens were wont to welcome the olympian victors of old days the public works which he designed were more to feed his pride than serve the public he wanted like another xerxes to cut a canal through the corinthian isthmus thought of making vast lakes to be supplied from the hot springs of baiae and schemed great works by which the sea might be brought almost to the walls of rome but it was only by his buildings that he left enduring traces and to this the great disaster of his times gave an unlooked-for impulse some little shops in the low grounds near the circus took fire by chance the flames spread fast through the narrow streets and crowded alleys of the quarter and soon began to climb up the higher ground to the statelier houses of the wealthy almost a week the fire was burning and of the fourteen wards of the city only four escaped unharmed nero was at antium when the startling news arrived and he reached rome too late to save his palace he threw his gardens open to the homeless poor lowered at once the price of corn and had booths raised in haste to shelter them he did not lack sympathy for the masses of the city whose tastes he shared and catered for and yet the story spread that the horrors of the blazing city caught his excited fancy that he saw in it a scene worthy of an emperor to act in and sung the story of the fall of troy among the crashing ruins and the fury of the flames even wilder fancies spread among the people men whispered that his servants had been seen with lighted torches in their hands as they were hurrying to and fro to spread the fire for nero had been heard to wish that the old rome of crooked streets and crowded lanes might be now swept clean away that he might rebuild it on a scale of royal grandeur 
certainly he claimed for himself the lion's share of the space that the flames had cleared the palace to which the palatine hill had given a name now took a wider range and spread to the esquiline including in its vast circuit long lines of porticos lakes woods and parks while the buildings were so lavishly adorned with every art as to deserve the name of the golden house which the people's fancy gave to them in its vestibule stood the colossal figure of the emperor one hundred and twenty feet in height which afterwards gave its name to the Colosseum. from it stretched porticos a mile in length supported on triple ranges of marble pillars leading to the lake round which was built a mimic town opening out into parks stocked with wild animals of every sort the halls were lined with gold and precious stones the banqueting rooms were fitted with revolving roofs of ivory perforated to scatter flowers and perfumes on the guests while shifting tables seemed to vanish of themselves and reappear charged with richest viands there were baths too to suit all tastes some supplied with the waters of the sea some filled with sulphurous streams that had their sources miles away thousands of the choicest works of art of greece and asia had been destroyed but their place was taken by the paintings and the statues brought from every quarter of the empire nero sent special agents to ransack the cities for art treasures and many a town among the isles of greece mourned in after days the visit that had despoiled it of some priceless treasure when all was done and the emperor surveyed the work even he was satisfied and he cried now at last i feel that i am lodged as a man should be it was in halls like these that the privileged few gathered round their lord when he returned from the grave business of the circus and the stage to indulge in the pleasures of the table otho the profligate dandy who had been complacent enough to lend his wife to nero tigellinus prefect of the guards ready to pander to his master's worst caprices vitinius the hunchback who had left his cobbler's bench and pushed his fortunes in the palace by his scurrilous jests and reckless attacks on honest men sporus the poor eunuch and pythagoras the freedman both degraded by the mockery of marriage with the wanton prince these and many another whose names have not been gibbeted in history left their memories of infamy in that house of gold the mood of the citizens meanwhile was dark and lowering as they brooded over their disasters and nero looked to find some victims to fill their thoughts or turn their suspicion from himself the christians were the scapegoats chosen confused in the popular fancy with the jews whose bigotry and turbulence had made them hated looked upon askance by roman rulers as members of secret clubs and possible conspirators disliked probably by those who knew them best for their unsocial habits or their tirades against the fashions of the times the christians were sacrificed alike to policy and hatred they deserved their fate says tacitus not indeed because they were guilty of the fire but from their hatred of mankind there was a refinement of cruelty in their doom some were covered with the skins of beasts and fierce dogs were let loose to worry them others were tied to stakes and smeared with tar and then at nightfall one after another they were set on fire that their burning bodies might light up nero's gardens while the crowds made merry with good cheer and the emperor looked curiously on as at the play no wonder that in the pages even of the heathen writers we hear something like a cry of horror and that in the christian literature we may trace the lurid colours of such scenes in the figures of antichrist and in the visions of the coming judgment but nero did not often waste his thoughts and ingenuity on such poor prey as the artisans and freedmen of the christian churches his victims were commonly of higher rank and the nearer to him the nearer they seemed to death his aunt followed his mother to the grave and her tender words to him as she lay upon her deathbed were rewarded by a message to her doctor to be prompt and close her pains octavia was soon divorced and killed on a charge of faithlessness which was so carelessly contrived as to shock men by its very wantonness of power popaia her successor was dearly loved and yet he killed her in a fit of passion with a hasty kick 
he soon wearied of the grave face of burris who read in his coolness the omen of a speedy death before long he grew sick and felt that he was poisoned he pointed to the blood that he spat up as the signs of princely gratitude would not see nero when he called to ask him how he felt but said only well and turned his face away and died seneca was longer spared but he too felt that his time must come he held himself aloof from court tried to give up all his wealth and honours to live austerely and by the lessons of philosophy to make himself strong and self-contained or to be director of the consciences of those who needed help and comfort but with a prince like nero even students were not safe and philosophy itself was dangerous ground the noblest minds at rome were at this time mainly stoics and among the long line of nero's victims there were many who were in some sense martyrs to the stoic creed they were not republicans though they have sometimes passed for such in later history they were not disloyal though they were looked at with disfavour they were ready to serve the ruling powers either in the senate or the camp there was a largeness even in their social views as citizens of the world that would seem to fit them markedly for carrying out the levelling spirit of the imperial policy nevertheless they were regarded with jealousy and mistrust nor is the reason for it far to seek stoicism in passing from the schools of greece had ceased to be an abstract theory with interest only for the curious mind that loved the subtleties of paradox it was a standard of duty for the romans and a creed to live and die for the resolute spirit and the hard outlines of its doctrines had a fascination for the higher type of roman mind to live up to the ideal of a noble life in which reason should rule and virtue be its own reward to care very much for a good conscience for personal dignity and freedom and to think slightingly of short-lived goods over which the will has no control here was a rule that was not without a certain grandeur however wanting it might be at times in tenderness and sympathy but such high teaching was distasteful to the sensualist and tyrant its tone rebuked his follies and his vices it set up a higher standard than the will of caesar and was too marked a contrast to the servile flattery of the times it was not the spiritual quixotism of a few which might be safely disregarded but men flocked to it on every side for lessons of comfort and of hardihood in evil days weak women turned to it to give them strength as aria in the days of claudius had shown her husband how to die when she handed him the dagger that had pierced her with the words see petus it does not hurt some spread the doctrines with a sort of apostolic fervour and may well have said at times uncourtly things of the vices in high places like the puritan preachers of our own land some again mistook bluntness of speech for love of truth like cornutus who when some one pressed nero to write a work in some four hundred books remarked that no one then would read them it was true chrysippus wrote as many but they were of some use to mankind others influencing the world of fashion in quiet intercourse and friendly letters showed the young how to live in times of danger or when the fatal message came stood by and calmed the pains of death like the father confessors of the church of the great stoics of the time there was no more commanding figure than that of thrasiapetus he had none of the hard austerity of a cato nor the one-sided vehemence of a social reformer he was fond even of the play and mixed gaily in the social circles of the city would not blame even vice severely for fear of losing sight of charity to men in the senate he was discreet and calm even when he disliked what was done tempered his blame with words of praise spoke of nero as an eminent prince and voted commonly with his colleagues though he did not stoop to mean compliance sometimes indeed he protested by his silence as when he rose and left the senate house rather than hear the apology of nero for the murder of his mother and when he declined to come and join the vote for the apotheosis of popaia at last when the evils seemed too strong for cure he would take no part in public actions for the last three years of his life he would not sit in his place among the senators nor take the yearly vow of loyalty nor offer prayer or sacrifice for caesar the rebuke of his silence was a marked one for the world watching his bearing 
turned even to the official journals to see what Thrasia had not done, and to put their construction on his absence. The calm dignity of his demeanour seems to have awed even Nero for a while, but at last the emperor wearied of his quiet protest. The fatal order found him in his garden, surrounded by a circle of his kinsmen and choice spirits, with whom he tranquilly conversed upon high themes. Like another Socrates, he heard his doom with cheerfulness, and passed away without a bitter word. Seneca, too, found consolation, but not safety, in the Stoic doctrines. He had long retired from the active world, and shunned the emperor's jealous eye. He sought in philosophy the lessons of a lofty self-denial, and was spending the last years of his life in studying how to die. The rash conspiracy of a few of his acquaintance, in which he took no part himself, was the excuse, though not the motive, for his murder. The sentence found him with his young wife and intimates, prepared for but not courting death. Denied the pleasure of leaving them by will the last tokens of affection, he told his friends that he could bequeath them only the pattern of an honest life, and gently reproved the weakness of their grief. His veins were opened, but he talked on still while life was slowly ebbing, and was calm through all the agony of a lingering death. 65 A.D. End of section 12《Section 13 of Roman History, the Early Empire by William Wolfe Capes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 5. Nero, A.D. 54-68, Part 3. Corbulo, the greatest soldier of his day whose character was cast in an antique mould and was true to the traditions of the camp, had also to experience the ingratitude of princes. He had led his troops to victory in the north, had baffled the Parthian force and guile, and saved a Roman army from disaster. He had been so loyal to his emperor in the face of strong temptation as to cause the Armenian Tiridates to say in irony to Nero that he was lucky in having such a docile slave. Suddenly he was recalled with flattering words. The death warrant met him on his way, and he fell upon his sword, saying only, I deserved it. So unlooked for was the deed that men could only say that Nero was ashamed to meet his eye while busied in pursuits so unworthy of a monarch. A crowd of other victims passed before us on the scene. The least distinguished were driven forth from Rome to people lonely islands, while the chiefs proved to the world that they had learned from the Stoic creed the secret how to live nobly and die grandly. Women, too, were not wanting in heroic courage. Paulina, the young wife of Seneca, tried to go with him to the grave. Others were glad to save their self-respect by death. Of these, some fell as victims to the jealousy of Caesar. Their eminence, their virtues, and historic names made them dangerous rivals. Some found their wealth a fatal burden when the emperor's wild extravagance had drained his coffers and fresh funds were needed for his lavish outlay. More frequently, they died to expiate a moral protest, which was often silent but not the less expressive. The absolute ruler was provoked by men who would not crouch or bend. He felt instinctively that they abhorred him, and fancied that he saw, even in the look of Thrasia, something of the sour pedagogue's frown. Their fate marked the crisis of the struggle between high thought and an ignoble acting. Lucan, too, at this time, by a less honorable death, closed a short life of poetic fame. He had risen to early eminence in the social circles of the capital, stood high in favor at the court where the passion for the fine arts was in vogue, and as the nephew of Seneca, he shared the studies and for a time the confidence of Nero but the sunshine of princely favor was soon clouded. He was coldly welcomed in the palace, and then forbidden to recite in public. What was the reason of the change we cannot say with certainty? Perhaps he was too bold in the choice of his great subject. The civil wars of the Republic had seemingly a fascination for the literary genius of this time, and many a pen was set to work, 
and many a fancy fired by the story of the men who fought and died in the name of liberty or for the right to misgovern half the world there was of course a danger in such themes julius caesar had written an anti-cato to attack a popular ideal and later rulers might be tempted to meet his eulogists with the sword rather than the pen historians had already suffered for their ill-timed praises of the great republicans and claudius had been warned not to meddle with so perilous a theme lucan therefore may well have given offence to the instinctive jealousy of a despot though he was not sparing of his flattering words as when he bids him take a central place among the heavenly constellations for fear of disturbing the equilibrium of the world and in the opening books at least which alone had seen the light he was wary and cautious in his tone or it may be he offended nero's canons of poetic style for he cast aside the old tradition and boldly dispensed with the dreamland of fable and all the machinery of the marvellous and superhuman he aspired to set history to heroic verse but claimed no knowledge of the world unseen or as it is more likely still his fame gave umbrage to his master who was himself a would-be poet and could not bear to have a rival whatever may have been the cause of his disgrace lucan could not patiently submit to be silenced his vanity needed the plaudits of the crowd his genius perhaps seemed cramped and chilled for the want of kindly sympathy for the habit of public readings then so common took to some extent the place of the journals and reviews of modern times and brought an author into immediate relation with the cultivated world for whom he wrote when this pleasure was denied him lucan first distilled into his poems some of the bitterness of his wounded pride and then joined a band of resolute men who were conspiring to strike down the monarch of whom they were long weary and to set up a noble piso in his place the plot came to an untimely end and most of those who joined it lost their lives lucan lost not his life only but his honour for when his fears were worked upon he gave evidence against his friends and even denounced his mother as an accomplice in the plot we can have little pity when we read that he could not save his life even by such means nor can we feel interest in the affected calmness with which in his last moments he recited from his poem an account of death agonies somewhat like his own there died at the same time the chief professor of a very different creed from that of the great stoics petronius had given a lifetime to the study of the refinements of luxurious ease his wit and taste and ingenuity had made him the oracle of roman fashion or the arbiter as he was called of elegance nothing new could pass current in the gay world of the city till it had the stamp of his approval he was the probable author of a satire which curiously reflects the tone of social thought around him its self-contempt its mocking insight and its shameless immorality the work is a strange medley it contains among other things a specimen of a heroic poem on the same theme as that of lucan's full of the mythological machinery which the bolder poet had eschewed and intended therefore possibly as a protest against lucan's revolutionary canons it gives us also in the supper of trimalchio a curious picture of the tasteless extravagance and vulgar ostentation of the wealthy upstarts of the times such as might please the fastidious pride of the nobles in roman circles it might amuse them also sated as they were with fashionable gossip to hear the common people talk and to be led in fancy into the disreputable haunts through which the hero of the piece is made to wander in the course of strange adventures like a Jules Blas of old romance. The writer, if he really was Petronius, roused at last a jealousy which caused his ruin. For the vile favourite Tigellinus, who had gained the ear of Nero and aspired to be the master of ceremonies at the palace, could not bear a rival near him. He trumped up a false charge against him, worked upon his master's fears, which had been excited lately by the widespread conspiracy of Piso, and had an order sent to him to keep away from court. Petronius took the message for his death warrant, and calmly prepared to meet his end. He set his house in order, gave instructions to reward some and punish others of his slaves, wrote out his will, 
and composed a stinging satire upon the emperor's foul excesses which he sealed and sent to him before he died it was noted that at the last no philosopher stood at his bedside to whisper words of comfort or dwell on hopes of immortality but that true even in death to his ignoble godless creed he amused himself as the streams of life were ebbing with frivolous epigrams and wanton verses besides the portents of cruelty and lust confined mainly to the walls of rome other disasters were not wanting to leave their gloomy traces on the annals of the times a hasty rising of the british tribes under queen Boadicea was followed by the sack of two great roman colonies camulodunum and londinium and the loss of seventy thousand men in armenia a general's incapacity had brought dishonour on the legions and nearly caused the loss of syria italy had been visited with hurricane and plague and the volcanic forces that had been long pent up beneath vesuvius gave some token of their power by rocking the ground on which pompey stood and laying almost all its buildings low it was the monarch's turn at length to suffer some of the agony now felt around him and after fourteen years he fell because the world seemed weary of him and none raised a hand in his defence the signal of revolt was given first in gaul where vindex a chieftain of a powerful clan of aquitania roused the slumbering discontent into a flame by describing as an eye-witness the infamy of nero's rule and the ends to which the heavy taxes were applied he told them of sporus carried as a bride in nero's litter and submitting publicly to his caresses of tigellinus lording it at rome and making havoc among noble lives while his master was fiddling in all the theatres of greece of popaea sabina first his mistress then his wife who had her mules shod with shoes of gold and five hundred asses daily milked to fill her bath of the countless millions wrung from toiling subjects and squandered on a vile favourite or a passing fancy waiving all hopes of personal ambition he urged galba the governor of spain to lead the movement and came to terms with verginius rufus who was marching from germany against him he killed himself indeed soon after with his own hand in despair when the soldiers of verginius fell upon his followers without orders from their general but galba was moving with his legions and courier after courier arrived in rome to say that the west of the empire was in arms nero heard the tidings first at naples but took little heed of anything except the taunts of vindex at his sorry acting and even when he came at length to rome he wavered between childish levity and ferocious threats sometimes he could think only of silly jests and scientific toys sometimes he dreamed of fearful vengeance on the traitors and their partisans in rome and then again he would drop into maudlin lamentations talk of moving his legions to sympathy by pathetic scenes or of giving up the throne to live for art in humble peace he tried to levy troops but none answered to the call the praetorian guards refused to march the sentries even slunk away and left their posts while the murmurs grew hourly more threatening and ominous cries were heard even in the city afraid to stay within the palace he went at night to ask his friends for shelter but the doors of all were barred he came back again to find his chambers plundered and the box of poisons which he had hoarded gone at length a freedman phaon offered him a hiding-place outside the walls and barefooted as he was with covered face nero rode away to seek it as he went by the quarters of the soldiers he heard them curse him and wished galba joy at last he and his guide leave the horses and creep through the brushwood and the rushes to the back of phaon's house where on hands and knees he crawls into a narrow hole which was broken through the wall stretched on a paltry mattress in a dingy cell hungry and turning in disgust from the black bread with the water from the marsh to slake his thirst he listens with reluctance to the friends who urge him to put an end to such ignoble scenes he has a grave dug hastily to the measure of his body and fragments of marble gathered for his monument and he feels the dagger's edge but has not nerve enough to use it 
he asks some of the bystanders to show him by their example how to die and then he feels ashamed of his own weakness and mutters fie nero now is the time to play the man at last comes phaon's courier with the news that the senate had put a price upon his head the tramp of the horses tells him that his pursuers are on his track and fear gives him the nerve to put the dagger to his throat while true to the passion of his life he mutters what a loss my death will be to art stoicism had taught his victims how to die with grand composure but all his high art and dramatic studies could not save him from the meanest exit from the stage his last wish was granted and they burnt the body where it lay to save it from the outrage that might follow two poor women who had nursed him as a baby and octe the object of his boyish love gathered up his ashes and laid them beside the rest of his own race it might be thought that few but his own pampered favourites could retain any affectionate remembrance of such a monster of sensuality and cruel caprice who at his best was moody and volatile undignified and vain yet it seems that a fond memory of him lingered in the hearts of many of the people who brought their flowers to deck his grave or posted up proclamations which announced that he was living still and would come to take vengeance on his enemies pretenders started up from time to time and gathered adherents round them in his name and even after twenty years one such adventurer of humble birth received from the parthians a welcome and support and was reluctantly abandoned by them at the last End of section thirteen